Hello, YouTubers. Jason here of Jason's 310, formerly Flyboy98. If you haven't seen my video uh, about rebooting the channel, please watch that first so you can get a bit of information and background on uh, my Cessna 310 adventures. So this is the first video as part of the new era of, of videos um, post-reboot here. I'd like to talk about Cessna 310 real-world performance numbers. So, you know, what you really see as an owner and an operator of a, of a Cessna 310Q, which is what I have um, out in the real world. So, uh, my airplane is equipped with two Continental IO470 VO, 260 horsepower, six-cylinder, normally aspirated engines. So, this uh, all applies to, to that. It's a 1974 310Q. And I'm going to address uh, the following areas, takeoff distance, uh, climb performance, which is really time to climb, uh, cruise speed, real world cruise speed, what I really see, uh, my range and endurance, and also uh, landing distance. And then just a quick word, uh, this don't use this for any real world performance planning. You need to refer to your POH if you're an owner or a pilot of a 310Q, so this is really just for entertainment, it's for prospective owners and, and or enthusiasts, general information only. So over uh, the many years I've owned uh, 310s, I've had two 310Qs with the same engines. I've managed to record a significant amount of uh, takeoff distance data, and this is the spreadsheet that I have in Excel. Um, so the first column on the left is the airport, and these airports range in elevation. If you look here, uh, between uh, basically sea level and up to almost 8,000 feet. Uh, for each takeoff, I recorded the temperature, the altimeter, uh, the pressure altitude, just by setting the altimeter to 29.92 or 1013 millibars. Uh, the, and then I calculated the density altitude um, for that uh, takeoff. Uh, most of these, I was fortuitous that uh, there was very little wind, so the wind really doesn't factor on these. And then I also recorded uh, the takeoff weight. And then finally, the takeoff distance, which usually came from uh, shooting a video and then, and then reviewing the video and seeing where I um, actually broke ground. So the procedure uh, for this kind of takeoff, for this data, is uh, flaps up, mixture leaned for the altitude. I'd release the brakes, uh, smoothly apply full power, but not all at once. I'd rotate around 90 knots, uh, which is about just below uh, blue line. And then I would uh, keep the nose down to accelerate to blue line plus 10 knots. So the, the asterisks there are to point out that this is not a maximum performance takeoff. This is like a maximum energy takeoff. I'm trying to get as much excess airspeed as possible uh, in case I lose an engine. The weights, uh, the maximum gross weight takeoff weight for my airplane is 5,300 pounds um, for again, a 1974 310Q. But I've tried, it, I've tried to kind of summarize this into two main weights that I typically am operating at. I've got one that I call heavy, which is 5,000 pounds uh, takeoff weight, which is about 300 pounds below gross. And that typically is uh, the tip tanks full four passengers and a fair amount of baggage. Uh, alternatively, there's a light weight, which is around 4,500 pounds, and that's typically full tip tanks, two passengers, and light bags. So this might be for a day trip or a, a short uh, overnight um, weekend break. So the takeoff distances, here's all the data. So the y-axis on the left is takeoff distance in feet. The x-axis down at the bottom is the density altitude. And then the points are all labeled with the actual takeoff weight in pounds. And so this is hand-drawn, this is hand-contoured in. There's obviously gonna be some uh, noise in the data and a bit of uncertainty, but these are roughly my heavy 5,000 pound line and my light 4,500 pound line. And it, it behaves as you would expect it to um, at 
near sea level density altitude, uh, there's not much difference in takeoff distance. Whereas um, when you get up to a density altitude of 7,000 feet, uh, the airplane is way more weight sensitive, as you can see by the divergence of those two lines. So to summarize this for takeoff distance, sea level heavy versus sea level light, somewhere between 1,700 to 1,900 feet. So let's just call it around 2,000 feet. Um, and then uh, a high altitude takeoff. So this is an actual flight that I've done a couple times from Gunnison, Colorado, early AM departure before the density altitude picks up, the density altitude around 7,500 feet and nice cool air and typically heavy. Um, so uh, this particular flight, there were four of us on board, full tip tanks and we're going to Vegas nonstop from Gunnison and we used 3,700 feet of runway. And then it probably took almost double that to get up to 100 feet. You know, it, it was a, a slow climb at that altitude until you get cleaned up and sped up. So uh, one final slide here on takeoff, just to note my personal minimums around Texas, where I'm, where I'm flying the most. Around here, uh, my minimum runway length light is about 3,000 feet. And typically, I operate from airport with a 4,000-foot runway. And really, I prefer 4,000 feet or greater, but this is just my, um, my personal minimum uh, runway length. Next, let's talk about time to climb and rate of climb. These data are based on four flight track logs, and most of these flights are kind of in Texas summer temperatures. I'm calculating this from the point that you see here, which is the point of takeoff as recorded on the track log, and taking the difference between the next point here, which is top of climb. These data are tabulated on this table. The columns from left to right are the approximate date of the flight, takeoff weight, the base altitude in feet, the top altitude in feet, total altitude gained or climbed, the time to climb in minutes, which is rounded in four flight, so there's a bit of uncertainty there, and then the average rate of climb, which is just actually uh, doing the math to calculate uh, the average rate. So the first two rows are September flights from McKinney, Texas, uh, pretty uh, good altitude gain of almost 11,500 feet, and those climbs took 13 minutes for an average rate of climb of 875 feet a minute. The next flight is in April. Uh, the reason I show that one, it's slightly cooler then. Again, almost 12,000 feet of altitude, or sorry, almost 11,300 uh, feet of altitude gain, and that one took uh, 13 minutes as well for an average rate of climb of 870 feet per minute. Uh, the May flight is a heavier weight. That's why I present this one here. Again, total altitude gain of now 10,700 feet with an average climb rate of 765 feet a minute. And then the final flight is a mountain takeoff from Montrose, Colorado. And that flight, uh, we took off at almost 6,000 feet, 5,800 feet, up to 14,000 and the total altitude gain of 8,200 feet, that climb took 16 minutes because it started at a higher altitude. And that was a fairly heavy flight as well. And that one had an average rate of climb of 510 feet per minute. So next let's talk about uh, cruise performance. I had the benefit in my previous 310 of a G500 and that automatically calculates uh, and displays true airspeed. Uh, and that airplane, it was in, because it was a 1970 model, it was in miles per hour, so I'm converting everything to knots. But I have extensive data I collected from that, and it's pretty simple. So I always fly above 10,000 feet, so I'm usually somewhere between 10.5 and 12.5. And very straightforward, it was like clockwork. In the summer, my true airspeed was 170 knots, and in the winter, my true airspeed was 175 knots. And that is uh, 22 gallons an hour. And that's 2,300 RPM and wide open throttle. And that's pretty much consistently uh, what I got in that altitude range. So 170 to 175 knots. And that's what this airplane is good for. 
So next topic is let's talk about endurance and range. Uh, so using the aforementioned power settings, I've graphed uh, many, many, many uh, fuel receipts on here. So this would be after a, a flight of anywhere between uh, about an hour and a half, and I had flights almost just shy of five hours. Uh, I would uh, fill the plane up, top it up completely full, and record how many uh, gallons of fuel that I used. And uh, if you, if you, I mean, there's a pretty linear fit here. If you look at the line of regression, so the line of best fit, uh, this airplane will fly until it runs out of fuel at about six hours and 15 minutes. So if you want to land with a one hour fuel uh, reserve, which is my rule, regardless of whether it's VFR or night or IFR, I like to land with at least an hour. That gives you an endurance of a about five hours and 15 minutes plus this one hour reserve. And if you do the math at 170 knots, it's uh, a little more than 875 nautical miles, but I'm rounded it down to 875 because that just gives a bit of allowance for the for climb. So um, that's basically the, the range. Uh, and then this is what it looks like on the map. So I'm currently based in Houston. And so this means that uh, I could go nonstop to Charleston. I mean, of course, depending on the wind, that's a no-win scenario, but I could go to Charleston or I could head up to Chicago or I should be able to make Western Colorado or uh, presumably maybe even Phoenix, just again, depending on, on how the winds are. So, but... so as far as landing distance, I haven't specifically tracked landing distance data as a data set. As I mentioned before, I, I kind of my personal minimum is around three to 4,000 feet, so I obviously won't land at an airport that I can't take off from. Suffice it to say, uh, at my home airport, West Houston, I usually make the second turnoff, which is about 2,500 feet from the threshold, and I don't land right on the threshold. There's trees um, across the ditch on the golf course to the north of the airport, so I'm probably coming over the threshold at 30, 40 feet, and I still manage to uh, turn off about 2,500 feet down. So um, again, that fits within the kind of 3,000 to 4,000 foot personal minimum that I have. So to summarize, um, obviously please determine the following for your own airplane. These are just um, my values. Uh, take off a minimum runway about three to 4,000 feet down here around sea level in Texas. Uh, climb, it takes about 13 minutes to climb up to a, a so-called high altitude cruise, so kind of 11 to 12,500 feet. Uh, cruise speed, very predictable, 170 to 175 knots on about 22 gallons an hour, so pretty, pretty efficient for a twin. Uh, endurance with one hour reserve is about five hours and 15 minutes. And then again, landing distance, uh, wouldn't, I wouldn't choose a runway any shorter than what I can take off from. So I'm, I'm limiting myself to about three to 4,000 feet, again, depending on weight and temperature, et cetera. So those are my numbers for the Cessna 310Q. So if you're a prospective owner or an enthusiast or just uh, curious what how a 310Q performs, uh, I think this is a, a good basic summary of what you can expect out of this airplane. So thank you very much for um, watching this video, and I promise to continue uploading new videos as I get time to make them. Thanks a lot. Bye.